Hey, Slick Talkers, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast, and I know that if you love this show, you'll also love my morning show called Good Morning Hospitality with my co-hosts Michael Golden and Brandy Canale as we spend 30 minutes every Monday morning to dive into the industry's top latest news and trending topics. So go check it out on wherever you find your podcasts at Good Morning Hospitality, and you can live stream with us on Monday mornings on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and of course, YouTube. Now, I hope you enjoy this episode. Episode. We need to just call the VRM industry what it is, and it's a form of e-commerce. Instead of the package arriving at your door, the guest arrives at the vacation rental door. But the same way they find it, they go on the internet, they click a bunch of properties, they pay with credit card. It's the exact same way you buy a tissue box from Amazon. So first, we need to accept that this is the e-commerce industry, which we still are not doing. We're still treating it like a real estate industry, which it partially is, but it is mostly not. It is an e-commerce industry. That's one of the reasons why OTAs have trust. When you go on a good e-commerce website and they're showing you things you want and the checkout is easy and the photos are easy to access and the information's all there and it's a beautiful template and platform, you trust that. It's weird, but you just do. You just trust a, a seamless, streamlined experience. So the first way to do that is treat it like e-commerce. Now let's look at the e-commerce industry. They've been around for almost 30 years at this point. Tech overload doesn't exist. They live in tech. Now we go to the vacation rental industry Tech only started existing in the last maybe five years, but really in the last three years, have we really been embracing tech? So the last three years, we've been doing 30 years of buying, buying, buying without the 30 years of educating. So uh, is there, is, are there too many shiny toys out there? Absolutely. And um, look, I go to the conferences just like you, and that's all the conferences are. That's all the exhibitors halls are. It's just a bunch of shiny toys, and everyone wants to buy the shiniest toy there. So, um, yeah, we need to start treating this like e-commerce, educate ourselves like e-commerce professionals, and then we can start talking about which tech is useful for each business. You're listening to Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast, a podcast for those who are in and around the hospitality industry who love, live, and breathe what they do. You can join us for candid and unscripted conversations with hospitality experts and founders as we go deeper into their personal stories while they're sharing their triumphs and trials that got them to where they are today. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and you're listening to an episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast. Now, let's begin. What's up, all my Slick Talkers? You are listening to another episode of Slick Talk, the Hospitality Podcast. And in this episode, Evan and I get into some conversations and talking points I normally wouldn't on the show, but he brings so many good points and references and just information to the space that it was such a refreshing conversation that I enjoyed so much, and I know you will too if you have been following along or if you're a first-time listener. This is a great episode to really dive in and get you thinking. But before we get to the episode, I want to give a big, big shout out to our friends over at Journey. Journey is the one place, the one-stop shop that you need to go in order to really power your vacation rental business or your boutique hotel. So if you're tired of having too many tools on too many dashboards and too many logins, sign up for Journey, have everything unified in one dashboard, one inbox, one everything, and get your operations right. I'm super excited to have them part of the podcast. And if you haven't checked them out already, go to journey.com, that's J-U-R-N-Y.com, and let them know that Will sent you. Now, back to the episode. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast. And I couldn't be more excited to have Evan Dalgo. Forgive me if I just butchered your last name, even though you asked me to, to uh, say it. Um, Evan, my friend, I'm super excited to have you on the episode today because you and I have had some really good chats. And like I've said to you before, you're like my friend Francois from Enzo Connect. You just kind of popped into the industry and have taken it by storm. You've impressed me. Uh, with the amount of connections you've been able to build and just the overall depth and knowledge, you've really you know, just dove into our industry and uh, it's really exciting. So uh, Evan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Will. And you know, I think we realized early on that the wind is behind us, young, hungry individuals who are looking to innovate, looking to raise the bar and uh, essentially move from pen and paper to what's next. So yeah, the conversations have been great and I'm excited for this one. 100% and ignore this pen and paper that's behind my, my laptop. I won't 
I won't show that on screen. We'll, we'll let it slide uh, this time. <laughs> uh, awesome. Well, dude, I'm excited. Let's jump in. I want to know um, for the audience, like, you know, where does your story really start? How did you get into real estate, into travel, into hospitality? Uh, I know that you are the head of uh, predictive hospitality at Jarvis. And so uh, let's let's jump into what that is, too. I, I'm a little bit more curious to to hear uh, about the product of Jarvis and the team. But anyways, your story, where does it begin? Yeah, a hundred percent. And uh, I think it begins with not believing what I see on the internet. So the mm. second I graduated high school, I went to live abroad in the Middle East where I worked in back of an ambulance, traveled all over, went to all the European countries. And I spent a whole year just exploring new cultures. And the truth is outside of America, these cultures are very hospitable. Whether you go to South mm. America, Europe, the Middle East, everyone has their own type of hospitality. So then when I got back, I went to the Rosen College of Hospitality in Orlando, where they taught us everywhere from beer and wine class, cooking class, hotels and golf course, country club. So then I got the professional angle. But at the same time, I was uh, involved in real estate. I was selling houses. I had a drone marketing business where we marketed um, some very lovely homes. And uh, through that, I got involved with investing into, uh, I guess, student housing, which is a form of short-term rentals. And that's where I, I made my first investments. And next thing you know, I was actually helping investors buy vacation rental properties. And then uh, I went to NYU and got my master's in sustainable real estate development. So that was the bridge of real estate and technology. And uh, at some point I had to pivot into uh, the technology side of things because I realized, okay, the real estate side's exciting, but that's the side that everyone understands. If as an industry, we want to uh, be at the forefront of advancing everything, we need to embrace technology and stop running away far from it. So that's how I ended up with Jarvis and and um, and talking to you. Awesome. Well, yeah, man, I, I at first I was like, man, you connected on LinkedIn. It was like immediately like we connected. I got a message and I was like, I don't know, like, you know how the, that those messages can be sometimes. And uh, but no, I'm super thankful we got to, to sit down and actually talk and get to know each other. Um, so tell me about student housing and a drone business. Uh, I always like to think or say that I think it's the most uncommon ways that a lot of us get into the space. Like it's so different for everybody else, um, which seems to be the common theme. So I guess uncommon is common for our industry. Uh, but how does student housing kind of open up? Was that an aha moment for you when it came to short-term rentals and you know, quote unquote Airbnb? Yeah, so student housing is an interesting one. So back in 2014, I was at the University of Central Florida, uh, Rosen College of Hospitality, and usually everyone lived on dorms, but then this concept of student housing living right off campus in these beautiful uh, complexes became very well known. So the way I got involved was actually, I, I started this company called Yo Apartment, which was a mm -hmm. Yelp for student housing. Because I realized that the student housing, were uh, the, the leasing offices were promising one thing, and then you get to your unit and it's it's the absolute opposite. So there was no transparency and they were charging a lot more money than everyone else. So I decided to do the Yelp of student housing and give the residents a voice. Very early on, I, I uh, discovered the, all the legal things that were going on. And uh, it, I had 100,000 plus users within the first few months. And um, we also had several cease and desist because we were exposing these bad practices that the student housing organizations were doing. So that was my entry. And then I realized early on too, that you could buy condos and essentially rent it every, every semester. So that's something I was doing with some of my buddies. And, uh, and yeah, the, the drone marketing was something I was a broker at the time. So in 2014, I bought the first drone, the DJI Phantom one, spent almost 2000 bucks on it. I was like an 18, 19 year old kid. And uh, every time I would go for a listing, I would also say hey, to the broker, hey, you have this beautiful home. You're a horrible photographer. Let me take the photo for you. Give me like two, 300 bucks in 10 minutes. I'll have the best photos ever. So next thing you know, that parlayed into me going to these 20, $30 million mansions, taking epic photos. I had an Instagram account called SoFlo Lux um, that had like 20,000 followers. So yeah, that whole world ended up combining. And then I, what I would do is I would fly my drone over the student housing properties and I would show their pool. I would get really, I guess that was the only positive of me showing them their cool properties. But then once you read the reviews, you're like, wow, that's sort of a facade. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's how I got in those worlds. That's crazy. And you can produce a picture like that from a drone in 10 minutes, no editing, or was it? I would edit it on my iPhone. So I would just touch the Dang. saturation, just quick, quick edits. And then I would send it straight from my car to their, to their email inboxes within 10, 10 20 minutes. 
Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. See, that's what I like, and this is going to lead into our like main overall, I think, conversation. But what I really like is just the, like you said, the wind behind our backs, and it's just it's a sail to uh, what we're doing as a younger generation in this industry. Uh, whether you look at it as hospitality or short-term rentals or restaurants or hotels, I look at it as the the global sense. But even for short-term rentals, as it's so quote unquote new. Um, uh, I think there's so much opportunity and it's people like you and others that we've gotten to meet in our space that really see that. And so for you, you know, let's, let's dive into, as you've gotten into short-term rentals, what has been the biggest thing you've seen as a, uh, as I want to, I don't want to like put labels or do anything like as a newer quote unquote person, I'm going to probably say quote unquote a lot throughout this episode, but um, you know, as a newer person, what's some, some big stuff that you've seen going into it? Yeah, I, it's just, you know, it's, it's real estate and technology mixed together like water and oil. And mm -hmm. I've positioned myself to be that egg that sort of binds the two together, that bridge where you can just essentially show you that with technology, you can, you can increase your profitability on real estate. But what I've noticed in the industry is that there is a lot of talking on as if everyone has the answers. So much talking and very little action and very little change. So I get yeah. it. These, a lot of these individuals have been in the industry for twice as long as we've been born. So they've done it right for X amount of time, for the last 50, 60 years, whatever that is. Now, though, with the OTAs becoming big technology and, and the landscape rapidly changing and moving towards technology, it's, it's just not going to work for the years to come. So I've seen a lot of talking, very little action. And I've also seen a lot of, um, a lot of arrogance that and we're just not paying attention to what happened in Europe. And I've been fortunate to connect with a lot of individuals in Europe who, who've led OTAs, they've led VRMs or short-term rental managers with thousands of units, and they've seen it. They're about two to three years ahead of us, and they've seen the full cycle from startup to consolidation to private equity coming in to OTA bullying, and now they're starting all the way in the beginning again, and the startups are emerging. So they've seen the full cycle. And I've learned a lot from them. And I don't see American VRMs learning anything from them. They're not even asking the questions. So I think uh, on the American side, it's, it's typical American of us to uh, pretend like we know all the answers. But um, what I'm trying to do is take a step back. Uh, and the part that we missed is education. So how do we educate the industry on technology instead of just selling them technology? So there's a few things and tidbits in there for you. Well, I was just going to say, so what, what are Americans focusing on then? Like, what is the big, you know, I, I try not to like, again, try not to do labels. I I'm very much ADHD oriented because, you know, I'm doing one task and all of a sudden I get drawn completely out of left field for something completely random that shouldn't have anything to do with my day, but it happens. And so I've one, it's either American to me or very, <laughs> very ADHD. Um, but what is the big shiny object that Americans are just paying so much attention to when it comes to avoiding, you know, what happened in Europe? Yeah, I think that object is, is community. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the American side of things, they've been doing it so long. It's, it's just this legacy club of, of very dusty uh, mentality where they just, they've been doing it this, they've been doing it their way for so long. Let's just keep talking about operations because that's all we know. And let's not talk about things we don't know, which is data and technology. So I'm coming and I'm saying, look, you're, you're, you're acting like you own a lot of real estate, but the truth is you don't own any real estate. You just manage properties. The asset you do own, which is data, you're not even paying attention to. And data carries a, a huge monetary value, huge residual value. So let's start paying attention to the, the asset you do, you do own, which is data. So um, that's where I'm trying to help help with that paradigm shift. Let's stop talking about how we're friends, how we all know the operations. We've got that down pat. Increasing your laundry operations and efficiency by 1% is not going to move the needle. What's going to move the needle is improving guest experiences by embracing data and personalizing communication, and everything else that comes with that. So, yeah. Well, so I'm a big operations guy and I look at it, I think the same way that you do too, is that I include data and tech into my operations. Without that, I don't have an operation. So what pieces of data, when you're talking data, I think, and you'll probably understand this too, coming from data world, is that I think people use that word and throw it around very loosely, um, not describing the micro details that go into what is data, how do we use it, how do you know how to use it, 
um, especially when it's just sitting in our software or in our, inside of our technology. So what, what really is the data that we need to be looking at when it comes to operations? Yeah, that's the craziest part because all these VRMs, they're collecting so much data and they don't even realize what gold is sitting underneath their belt. So let's just start. What is data? Data is anything that's ever been collected in the digital world. So whether they've clicked around on your website, they've engaged with your marketing, uh, whether they've booked with you before, those are all data points. And there's thousands and thousands, not millions of data points within that, which are very important. So first of all, let's just acknowledge what data you have, which is from your CRM, your PMS, your, your IOT devices. So now you have the smart locks, you got the iPads and the digital concierges. Data is everywhere. So now that we have data everywhere, how do we interconnect it? So that's part of what I've been doing with Jarvis ML is interconnecting it all, making sense of it and showing you what you can do with your data. So some of those things are, let's say, exactly what the OTAs do. There's a reason every time I, I just saw this, uh, this article that said, 75% of like travelers prefer to go to the OTAs because it's an easy experience and they trust that they're getting what they're paying for. So the reason is because the OTAs, they're big technology. The VRMs on the other hand, they're doing everything manually. So we know that, and I, I especially I know reaching out, trying to do sales, that everyone's bandwidth is maxed out. And the truth is that's gonna only stay like that. And the reason is, is because we're grappling with data manually. You have the marketing teams going into the database, sending email blasts. Next thing you know, they get a bunch of unsubscribes and then they try to figure out who's unsubscribing and they're just constantly grappling and putting out fires manually because they're grappling with their data manually. So what OTAs do and what, what big tech does is they have systems in place to interconnect all the data, machine learning engines to make sense of things. And then within the blink of an eye, how do we show them the properties they wanna see? How do we respond with a personalized message based off of their preferences, their purchasing power, their behavior? How do we essentially scale like an OTA so that VRMs can also personalize their booking journeys for every single guest, no more generic email blasts. So that's a lot of what I've been doing with Jarvis is turning individual VRMs into their own OTA. Because at the end of the day, why do VRMs use the OTAs? The same reasons that guests use it. They make it easy. They bring the customers, they're seamless, they're, they're fast. So the different, the problem is, is that one, they charge these huge fees and two, they keep all of the data. Mm -hmm. That's how they force the VRMs to come back every time because the OTAs understand the value behind data. And they also understand that VRMs don't care about the data. So it's a win-win for them. And uh, that's where I'm coming. I'm trying to, ha I'm trying to change the, have this paradigm shift where we start paying attention to the data, swing the pendulum back into the hands of small business. And let's start running towards the data and show, say like, Hey, it is not that scary. You have all this gold, snap your fingers and you can start deploying these data back decisions. Well, and to kind of bring up a friend of ours, Damian Sheridan, he and I kind of always talk about, you know, uh, the book direct show or the book direct movement isn't, you know, anti OTA in the sense of never list on them again. You're always going to have your own book direct website, never to be in any type of other marketplace, but is to take control of your business in the sense that these big OTAs, whether it's Airbnb, Verbo, Expedia, which is Verbo, uh, Booking.com, anything like that, they're not giving you any information. So you have to do, again, manual tasks in order to actually capture that. So I think the biggest thing, and one thing that you were, were saying was uh, OTAs are easy and they have trust. So how does the VRM community or even just the hospitality community get to the point where we have the overall user's data and we make it easy for them to give their data, but two, how do we get them to trust us? Because I think, you know, Chris Mon from IPRAC is always speaking about trust on, on social media and through what they're doing with uh, their IPRAC movement, but um, sometimes it's easier said than done. So 100%. What, what's the, what's the overall, I, there's a lot that we can unpack too. Yeah. I'm just thinking about like the, you know, VRMs don't have a lot of understanding yeah. of data and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, keep going. I'll let you da go. Damien Sheridan is the man. Um, he's, he, he's European. So he's seen it all happen in Europe and now he sees what's happening in America. And I'm actually speaking at his scale rental show in Barcelona on May 26th on the topic. I think the title is run towards your data. It's a valuable asset. So he under, and, and the scale rental show are for uh, VRMs or short-term rental managers that have 50 plus units and are looking to scale. So that's the, that's really the question on, on when data becomes valuable and when you can start to automate things. 
So mm -hmm. if let's say you have 30, 40 units and you have a couple thousand guests a year, the truth is a human can handle that amount of data. They can figure out, they can appeal emotionally to their guests and emails. It gets, once you start hitting 50 plus properties, that's when a human no longer can handle the tens of thousands of guests, the personalization. That's when a machine starts to do a better job at personalizing experiences, personalizing communication, personalizing booking journeys um, better than a human. So the reason that the OTAs have trust is because when you land on an OTA's website, they immediately start predicting what a guest wants. They know all of their behaviors. They know if they like pools or they like mountains. Do they like beaches or do they like uh, nature? So off the bat, the OTAs start personalizing the booking journey the second you land on their website. Let's say you leave their website. The OTAs are going to send you an abandoned cart, an abandoned browse email with personalized properties that are, again, personalized to your uh, preferences, your affinities. They're not similar to the ones you're looking at per se. They're actually personalized to you. So then... What the OTAs do is they keep you in their ecosystem of communication and using machine learning engines, they personalize communication, they personalize everything. So next time you think to go look for your vacation, you're immediately going to go to the OTA. The OTA becomes the starting point. So that's where, uh, that's where data becomes really valuable because that's how the OTAs automate this entire process. They collect data from all over the place. They centralize the data location and then they deploy it. And all of this is automated. It's all, it's all very seamless, and that's how, that's how you scale like an OTA. Once you hit that data threshold, you need to put the systems in place to essentially automate the, the manual data workload. You can't keep grappling with it if you want to scale. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of money on employees rather than getting the right technology to put superpowers at your employees' fingertips so they can be 10 times more productive. So that's, uh, that's where... That's, I think, the, the scale rentals is very interesting because that 50 units is really a good threshold for when it's no longer getting shiny toys to add to your business. It's actually buying useful software that will optimize your efficiency. Well, I was going to say then, so what is the solution for smaller brands, DRMs, to be able to do that like an OTA? I love that you said how to scale like, like an OTA because, you know, obviously Airbnb is a great example for what that looks like, you know, from going through uh, their original startup phase to then almost going public to then almost going bankrupt and then raising more money during COVID. And then of course, actually going public. So um, there's a lot of money moving through them, but there's not a lot, like the margins are already so thin as a vacation rental manager. If you're only making 20, maybe up to 30% of the booking volume or the booking revenue, that, that's that's not a lot to play with, especially when you have a tech stack. You have, uh, of course, then your team and overall ops uh, and whatever else that kind of goes in between. But uh, what what does that look like for an individual yeah. you know, company? It's uh, so for a company that's growing. Um, let's say myself, for example, I have investments with some buddies, and we're we're scaling. Yeah. The key is just to have an infrastructure that collects data and and cultivates everything, and just make sure that data is rich with. All, anything you can collect on the person, that is very valuable down the line. So right now we aren't deploying all these machine learning features simply because we can't. We're too lean. We're too small. But what the best thing a growing VRM could do is just get your, your basic tech stack organized. Make sure your PMS, your CMN, CRM are, are functional and they're capable of cultivating all that data in an organized way. So as soon as you hit that threshold, which ends up becoming a lot quicker if you're a property manager, you can snap your fingers implement these these smart uh, tools like machine learning and you can start predicting what guests want you can start personalizing communication so it's really about first organizing yourself and what that does too is it, is it frees up your bandwidth you're not fighting putting out fires constantly because you're on top of your technology so that's where that's where i think the industry skipped a step for example i, I compare this a lot to the e-commerce industry so um just to pivot my last venture was in warehouse development which is supporting the e-commerce industry and you know, if we everyone goes on Amazon to buy a product. So when we go on Amazon to buy a product, let's say we both look up the word tissue box, we'll likely get the same products with different photos, different prices. We'll get different products. Maybe it'll show me some baby wipes. It'll show you paper towels because Amazon knows what you like and they know what I like and they know all 10 million other people any given second like, so they personalize their customer journeys on their website. The person who sold us the tissue box doesn't even get our name. Why? Mm. Because we're Amazon's customer. 
we're not that tissue boxes customer. So next time we go buy a tissue box, we're gonna go back to Amazon, the same thing. That's exactly what the OTAs are doing. The reason Amazon's able to do that is because they truly understand us, similar to how social media shows us what we want, Amazon uses a machine learning engine to predict what we want. So the idea of just getting all your data in one spot, having it organized. So as soon as you hit that point that you can take the next step, that's the key to scaling VRM. Damn, that's really good. Well, I also had like the immediate question because you're talking about, and maybe for the listener's sake, that is, you know, there's a lot of technology inside of hospitality as a whole, but I feel like there's a lot more in short-term rentals um, than probably most would expect. Uh, you have, you have, you know, property management software, CRM, operation software, uh, dynamic pricing software, turnover software, uh, whatever else that you can go into, guest screening software, guest insurance software, all this stuff. My question to you is, do you think we have too much? Yeah, that's the great point. And that's the exact part what I meant that we skipped the step of education and we just started buying. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I'm trying to go back and, and really educate on, on what's useful and what's not. But first we need to just call the VRM industry what it is. And it's a form of e-commerce. Instead of the package arriving at your door, the guest arrives at the vacation rental door. But the same way they find it, they go on the internet, they click a bunch of properties, they pay with credit card. It's the exact same way you buy a tissue box from Amazon. So first we need to accept that this is the e-commerce industry, which we still are not doing. We're still treating it like a real estate industry, which it partially is, but it is mostly not. It is an e-commerce industry. That's one of the reasons why OTAs have trust. When you go on a good e-commerce website and they're showing you things you want and the checkout is easy and the photos are easy to access and the information's all there and it's a beautiful template and platform, you trust that. It's weird, but you just do. You just trust a, a seamless, streamlined experience. So the first way to do that is treat it like e-commerce. Now let's look at the e-commerce industry. They've been around for almost 30 years at this point. Tech overload doesn't exist. They live in tech. Now we go to the vacation rental industry. Tech only started existing in the last maybe five years, but really in the last three years, have we really been embracing tech? So the last three years, we've been doing 30 years of buying, buying, buying without the 30 years of educating. So uh, is there, is, are there too many shiny toys out there? Absolutely. And um, look, I go to the conferences just like you, and that's all the conferences are. That's all the exhibitors halls are. It's just a bunch of shiny toys, and everyone wants to buy the shiniest toy there. So um, yeah, we need to start treating this like e-commerce, educate ourselves like e-commerce professionals, and then we can start talking about which tech is useful for each business. 100%. And a big prediction that we've kind of had on the morning show that we do is that there, there's been a lot of capital infusion right into the space. Uh, we've seen a lot of people raise series A's, B's, C's, you name it, pre-seed seeds. Um, but now we're starting to see a lot of acquisition and roll-ups. Uh, finally, OTAs are, or not OTAs, but like let's say dynamic pricing software, data companies are buying littler ones to kind of roll under to one brand. Um, do you think one more of that's going to happen or do you think more and more little pop-ups and startups are going to show up a little bit, um, and try to break their way through as everyone, you know, I was just kind of going over through an episode, um, that's coming out this week with Andrew McConnell and kind of talk about a, a gold rush, right? Like with the gold rush that happened, uh, everyone went to look for the gold and went through all this stuff and wasted a ton of materials. There was tons of buzz and press around it. There was tons of competition, all this stuff. And then every, all of a sudden, everyone just left. And it left it empty and trashed and disgusting. And that's what happens when uh, there's no you know, education. There's no slowing down of like, okay, let's perfect the guest experience from booking to check out. There's no, none of this stuff, right? It's just, a bombard, you know, rush it and, uh, you know, leave. Uh, do you think there's going to be a lot more of these little, and I won't say little, but startups that are coming up, uh, versus rollups? Yeah, it's definitely both, but it's, it's like any business cycle where you have, it's a four stage process where at first you have the concept and idea and startups phase two, you have, I guess the businesses mature and they start to take some market share phase three, you have consolidation. So the rollup companies come in. And then once there's no more roll-ups, then you just have a bunch of big conglomerates. Then phase four is mergers and acquisitions. So I think we're right in that, uh, we're a mix of one and two at this point. And the roll-ups are just starting, as you said. So 
the roll-ups are reaching the same exact problem as the VRMs because they came in thinking like VRMs, not tech companies. And this is where I'm having fun because now I'm advising roll-ups on how they need to succeed. So, um, so let's talk about consolidation on the VRM side. For a roll-up to succeed, they need a, a plug-in-place tech stack. They need a, a reliable CRM PMS. They need, let's say, 10 core tools where every VRM they buy, they carve out their properties, they plug them into their tech stack, onto the next plug in place, carve them out, plug in place, carve them out, plug in place. And you keep, next thing you know, you have this conveyor belt that's easily just plugging in place to this tech stack you've created. And that's how you become efficient because every time a company doubles, it should at minimum become 20 to 30% more effective. So if you're gonna constantly roll up hundreds of units, you're gonna keep doubling. The only way to reach that effective percentage is by is by um, like scaling like an OTA, by having that plug in place tech stack where you just keep putting them in. So from the, from the VRM angle, absolutely, uh, it, is this going to continue? I think we're going to have a lot of obstacles, which I'm seeing because, again, these are real estate players rolling up. They're not tech companies doing the roll-up. Now we have consolidation on the tech side. You have over 1,400 global PMS systems out there. That's ridiculous. You have all these little yeah. guys going, and they're, they're taking out a few units here and there. There's got to be consolidation, but it's going to be a major pain in the ass, like, Let's be real. The amount of integrations that you're going to have to do to start taking all these properties out of certain PMSs and becoming one, I don't know how they're going to solve that, but it's got to happen. Um, and yeah, the reason I think that there are a lot of startups in the, the technology space is because it's so new. It's so raw. They're, they're, the industry is growing at, at a huge percentage every single year. Uh, just in America alone, it's over a $20 billion industry. It's going to double in the next few years at least. Now you have the flexible living, you have co-living, it's branching out into a ton of short-term living uh, types of concepts. So it's exciting. It's, um, it's, a, it's one of the hottest asset classes. And yeah, I think, again, this goes back to the conversation of education. We got yeah. to embrace education now because this should have been done yesterday. Well, it's crazy that you bring up flex living, co-living, all this other stuff, because if you asked me in the heat of 2020 with COVID, I was saying, literally, I will I probably won't be able to find a clip, but if I could find the clip of me saying it on the record, I was like, shared accommodation is never coming back. Co-living is never coming back. Like, no one's going to want to be in the same room as strangers. And I feel like it's gone complete opposite now. Like, literally, it's all people want to do. They just want to experience something new. I just met with... Uh, Steve Cody a couple months ago, who's oh, uh, co dude, amazing guy founding uh, bunking.com. And I think that concept itself is amazing. Once my lease is done here, I'm probably just going to go live in a bunking pod for the rest of my life. Um, but anyways, there, there's, there's a lot of that coming up, which is really interesting and really unique. And I love uh, companies like Muse that have created their software to become like a profile rather than a software where it's a CRM powered uh software that remembers the guests based off of their experience, whether they stayed with you once or a hundred times, uh, that predictive kind of software is, is there. But do you think, uh, well, I was going to say, do you, do you think that the isolation that COVID caused many individuals, as soon as they got out of it and they had some freedom, everyone's seeking that social connection. Like I talked with Steve at, at bunking and he, yeah. he calls it like it is. He's like, we need human interaction. So he's literally creating an entire platform on human interaction and living. So do you think COVID was a major like, okay, we swing, we, we were at this point where we we're all hanging out. Then we go to not hanging out. Now we're going to want to live with each other and hang out at all times of the day. Yeah. I would say COVID definitely has had a part, but I think what the biggest thing is, is that, you know, yes, we weren't with each other for a long time, but I think people had a big wake up. I think a lot, I, the, the big resignation is a great example is that why are so many people quitting their jobs? Because they're unhappy, not because they, you know, they're not being paid enough. Yeah. There's a lot of factors that go into it, but they're unhappy. They hate what they do. These, a lot of these jobs suck. I, you know how many jobs are on my resume that actually aren't on my LinkedIn? It's because they sucked. They were horrible jobs. I hated it. I was miserable. Uh, I didn't relate. So of course, when you have a bunch of people that one, get disconnected from their loved ones and, and, and just the overall experience of getting to meet new people at coffee shops or go to a bar or do this or do that, that, but then they realize that they hate their life. What they, what they do 80% of the time, not their life at like, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but they hate that when they wake up, they immediately go straight to work and they're in a 20 to 30 to maybe even longer, uh, commute with, you know, a, you know, 
a, a, a city or a town that they're not really happy with. Maybe they grew up there. I think that has a big part, part of it. You know, a lot of people woke up. I myself woke up in the sense of like, why am I back in my hometown in Washington state? I hate it there. It rains nine months out of the year. Uh, it's beautiful in the spring and summer. So definitely we'll visit, but I don't want to, I want to be in the sunshine. If I, if I'm not married without a house and no kids, why, why would I stay somewhere that I'm not happy at? So I think that was a, a big play. And I think bunking is just a perfect, you know, tool or platform that allows people that have that realization to aren't tied anywhere and definitely need that human connection. I was in, excuse me, I was in Mexico for a month and the one big takeaway and lesson that I had from that was not that I didn't pick the best place to go or just stay or whatever is that I definitely should have done it with somebody. I should have had someone who stayed with me for the month and we could have had the option to go out together or to stay in or to go to the beach or to lay by the pool or whatever that may be. Um, you know, that human connection It's great to meet strangers, but it's also nice to have that familiarity of, Hey, let's, let's do something together. Let's have that option. So sorry to ramp and go ramble on a little bit, but I love it all. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, no, you, I want to kind of get back to some things that you keep saying and you keep talking about education and, uh, you, you know, we've talked about conferences. We've talked about, uh, this type of stuff. What's, what's your overall opinion in, in the, in the space? I think we're, we're seeing education, but not in the ways that we need to. Yeah. Um, look in the, in the shortest way possible, it, it's a joke. It's really a joke. Um, and I, I get it. I think it's more so community. I think it's like saying hi to old industry friends, feeling part of a club. Um, it's, it's more on that rather than what are we doing to raise the bar? What are we doing to ensure our success for years to come? I do not think the conferences that I've at least attended so far have addressed that. And um, yeah, there are some conferences coming up on data, but they're mainly focused on revenue, uh, revenue management. So everyone uses dynamic pricing. like. What are we really talking about? It's the same exact tools. Just plug it in. Just follow it. You're not going to be able to dive to the core of it because at the end of the day, I, I was just at Verma Spring Forum and there were all these dynamic pricing softwares were talking on, on the stage. And at the end of the day, um, I think Steve Milo said it, he said all these companies have garbage data. They combine it and then they send out a little less garbage data. So it's like, what's the conversation there? How is that actually going to improve your VRM? It's sort of like talking about global politics as if that's affecting your personal life. No, it's not. You have, to, you have to go local if you want to make an impact on your life. So instead of let's talking about these dynamic pricing trends and revenue management on at scale for the entire industry, let's start talking about the small things, the little bets we can take that you can start using your data and you, could start in, you can start improving your individual business. Let's not talk about the industry and try to fix the world before we fix our own operations. If everyone focuses on leveling up their own operations, the industry will level up as a whole. So um, that's actually an interesting segue uh, for what I wanted to bring up called predictive hospitality. And that's yeah. something I've been working on where I'm going to assemble a group of individuals, people like you and I and Francois and Damien who just, who get it, who want to push the bar, who want to level up the industry and who also don't have an attitude where they think they own everyone, they own the space, they don't need the young people. This is going to be an inclusive, collaborative space and a, a platform for us to talk about technology, to do education the right way, and to, yeah, just essentially level up the industry on a local level, which by default will have an impact on a more uh, grander scale. So I think that's the way to do it. Focus small. And that will have an impact and create that community in the scale. And also, let's let's take the power back from some of these old organizations that are doing it the old school way. Let's start bringing it to the young guys and to the people who are forward thinking and to the ones that are, are trying to make a difference. So um, I'm excited to to dive deeper into that uh, in the coming weeks. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited because they're. <sighs> yeah, you you just struck a chord. It's just like besides that, it all will, uh, dude. It's. It's rough. Like, you know, I uh, coming from the hotel industry first, you know, the biggest thing was that I was always the youngest one in the room. So like granted there was a couple of bell boys or maybe some room service staff or whatever bartender servers that were about my age or a little bit younger going through high school and just trying to, you know, earn a little paycheck. Uh, but when you get to a certain level, like I was the youngest hotel manager on the Oregon coast, I was, I was 22 or 23 years old. 
And so to be compared with these people that are in their 50s, 60s um, with passion, with hunger, with experience, not that I had 40 years of experience, but experience enough to say, hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is what we need to do in order to address, you know, the guest needs or the guest com complaints or whatever. And the number one answer I always got was, well, this is how we've been doing it for 20 years. It's never going to change. You know, booking.com is always going to be 80% of our revenue or whatever they were saying and kind of just being let go. And I think, you know, like you said, these, these organizations aren't really looking towards, there's a couple of people that keep their nose up uh, to people like you and me that come in with a lot of passion, uh, a lot of experience in different areas and see that there could be some, there could be some better opportunities, uh, you know, take an action on and they don't. And to anyone listening, guess what? There's a ton of us. There's a ton of us talking. Right. I just want to say that like, there's so many people talking behind the scenes, uh, that are just getting to the point where, like you said, it's, it's, we're fed up with this like old boys club where it's, you know, uh, it, you get really comfortable and it becomes like a click. It's like we're in high school again, I feel like. And it's really <laughs> annoying because it's like, oh, the jocks are over there. The, the math club is over there and you got, you know, the band kids over here. And it's like, that's, that's not how our industry is supposed to be. If we're talking about diversity, inclusion, and, and all this other stuff, then why are we segregate, you know, segregating each other by, you know, this like, oh, I've been here longer than you. So, you know, not to call anybody out or say anything, but it's just, it's gotten frustrating. We're talking behind the scenes and uh, I'm excited for predictive hospitality because um, I think, you know, with what we do with the podcast is, yeah, we bring a voice to the industry, but I think, um, you know, in order to power a voice, you really need to have a platform for that voice to be on. And, and so I'm really excited to hear more about what you're doing and just to see how you've taken the industry by storm already. Uh, again, very impressed, very, very much so impressed. Well, it's like, it's like we're in high school again with our parents' generation. So it's like to, the, the clicks are the young people and the old people. And some of the old people want to be young again, but they're already too deep with the old. So it's <laughs> like, and, and you know what, though? The momentum is, is behind us. Like, again, we got Francois of Enzo Connect. We got the Rent Responsibly team. We got teams all over. Look at you. You left several months ago. You already got 30 podcasts under your umbrella. Like, like round of applause. It's, you got momentum. You got the, the actions here. So just to bring everyone together and, and um, have us all here together. That's, that's the way we're going to succeed. I'm sorry. It, uh, your, your thing completely froze. Yeah. I was, I was just bringing it uh, back around and saying like, look, just having all the young people motivated and look, we got funding behind us. Now we, we aren't, we're not kids. We're able to go. We have access to millions of dollars, just like the old people do. And we're taking advantage of it. And we're, we have the, we have the momentum and it's about, now in the next few months, how do we embrace that? And how do we team up to one, focus on the industry, but two, let's get rid of these lines. Let's start blurring the lines of between hotel and vacation rental with technology. And let's also start blurring the lines between uh, what does it mean to be a data forward operation versus a VRM? It's just being a good operation. It's not one versus the other. It could, you could do both. So let's, um, I, think, I think the power is in our hands and, and I'm pretty confident we're going to seize it. 100%. And the cool thing I like about it too, and I, I'm a big Gary V fan. I think we kind of connected on that as well. Uh, big Gary V, you know, motivation type of things. But the cool thing that always kind of helps ground me a little bit too is like, we are young and not that like that's a bad thing or a good thing. But at the end of the day, if we fail, which we've all failed, if we fail, we are able to rebound so quick, especially because, uh, you know, guys like us, no, not married, no kids, all that stuff. Like we're able to just kind of like, you know, okay, let's reassess what happened. Let's analyze it, process it and move on and keep going. Let's start over. Uh, versus if we were in our eighties or seventies, you know, we don't have that much time on our hands in order to do that. So, uh, it's kind of a, it's, it's a good way to kind of just humble yourself a little bit. Like, all right, don't put the pressure on too much. If you fail, guess what? You're going to be able to start over and just keep going. Like at the end of the day, it's not going to, you know, we're not solving, you know, um, Annie Holcomb, she always says we're not solving cancer, right? So uh, we're not curing cancer. Let's let's just keep going and, and figure out what's the, what's next. So I like, I like it's, that It's the perfect cocktail for success because look, we, we're young. We got more time in our day. We work harder. We have more energy. Um, we And, and most importantly, 
we grew up in the age of technology. So this isn't a foreign language for us. And going forward, anyone who bets against technology is, is crazy. You can't bet against technology going forward. So the fact that we already have a strong foundation in technology, and now we're, we're going forward and essentially bridging the gap between real estate and technology, that positions us perfectly. So I'm really confident that, that we got this and we got that paradigm is going to shift and it's going to be in our hands. Agreed. I love it, man. Well, I think we covered a lot in such a short period of amount of time. I feel yeah. like we could chat for hours. Um, but one of my favorite kind of ways to wrap up an episode and for all the listeners, I definitely think there's not think I definitely know there's going to be a part two, potentially three, four, five, six, uh, to this episode, this conversation will continue to evolve. Uh, so be ready because it's going to be pretty, pretty intense. Uh, but Evan, the, uh, the one, one thing I like to wrap up with is, you know, if you could give any audience member that's listening, uh, uh, one link to kind of, you know, go to for, to learn more about you, to more, learn more about what we're talking about, whatever it may be, uh, what would that link be and where would you send them? Yeah, I would send them to my LinkedIn. So I don't use social media um, except for LinkedIn. And what I try to do is I try to blog and I try to um, tell a story from a lot of different angles. I try to show them how I have a real estate background. I have several million square feet of warehousing under development. I have a technology background and I try to bridge the gap and show how they do work together when you, when you set them up properly. So if you want to learn more, I, I suggest going to my LinkedIn and um, just direct message me. I'm, I'm human. I'm not too busy. I have bandwidth because I embrace technology. So uh, I'm, I just, I'm here to work on leveling up the industry as a whole. And, um, and look, if there's something I could leave the industry with, it's that we've taken a huge amount of market share from the hotel sector. And the hotel lobby is one of the strongest in the United States. And what we just saw in Hawaii, they literally just outlawed vacation rentals because the hotels were get were said, stop, the, get rid of them to the politicians. And the politicians said, of course. So that's happening. And I've actually witnessed this in my previous venture in the warehousing sector, because that's the number one asset class in the United States, which means it's also public enemy number one. Americans want their packages in 30 minutes, but they don't want a warehouse in their town. Make your mind up. So what happens when you become a rising real estate asset class, you become, you, go, you join the spotlight. So with short-term rentals, that would put us at asset class number three behind multifamily and, where, and warehousing. We are rising fast, which means we are catching eyes. We've caught the eyes of the hotel lobby who are taking advantage and they're way ahead of us in, in shaking the right hands. So we need to level up now. We need to level up yesterday because we have so many people rooting against us and acting against us that if we don't join together, stop acting like everyone knows the answers and start collaborating, then we're going we're gonna to meet the same end that you're at. And um, it's my goal to prevent that through education, through community like, like us that we have right here, and through just leveling up the industry as a whole. So that would be the final note that I would leave the audience with. And definitely, uh, definitely I'm down for a few more of these to keep going below the surface. Damn, you just got me jacked up. I'm going to be energized all damn day. <laughs> uh, it's going to be good. Well, you uh, you heard it here first, Slick Talkers. Everything that we've discussed, you can find more on LinkedIn. So make sure you like, subscribe to everything about Evan and what he's do doing and talking about. And, of course, we're going to have more conversations like this in the future. So, Evan, my friend, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. And uh, we'll see you very soon. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your contributions to the industry because we would not be leveling up without you. So thank you as well. Hey, all right. I got I to cool off a little bit. You're, you're, you're too kind, my friend. You're too kind. All right, Slick Talkers, you heard it here first. So we'll see you guys all again next week. Thank you so much for listening. And thank you to our show partners for making Slick Talk, the hospitality podcast possible. We hope you enjoy the show and we would love to connect with you outside of the podcast. So you can follow us on all of our social media channels for daily hospitality content or find us on slicktalkthepodcast.com. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe so you never miss an episode. I'm your host, Will Slickers, and we will see you guys all again next week. Oh, 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 oh,